folks, I am very happy to welcome to As the World Churns, Tom DiLibrito, who is the media director of Climate Central and was a former NOAA uh, employee who was let go, fired. And today you join us on the heels of tragedy that has continued to unfold. I mean, I'm coming on air with you right now and the total number of deaths of the Texas flash flood at the Guadalupe River is now at 95. 95 deaths and more are missing. The Care County mayor has, you know, told folks that prepare for a very long week ahead as they continue to do a search and rescue for the missing. Tom, I I just, you know, I want to start out with, you know, with your thoughts on on this, given the fact that we've spent a lot of time on, you know, on this show, just talking about the fact that this was preventable. These, you know, these deaths were preventable. So from your vantage point, please. Yeah, well, first, it's a horrible tragedy. And this happened in a place in the country the hill country in Texas, which is kind of known for flash floods. I've heard flash flood alley. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if you were trying to create a more nightmarish scenario, you would have basically created what just happened um, in that area. You would have had these slow moving thunderstorms taking advantage of huge amounts of moisture in the atmosphere helped along by warmer than average temperatures in the air, warmer than average temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico. And they slowly moved and dumped tons of rainfall that all washed into the river that led to this flash flooding. And whenever you have something like this with this much loss of life, this much damage, you know, in my eyes, it's a failure. It's it's obviously it's a huge failure. We should not have have anyone to go through this. Mm-hmm. And the scary thought here is that while this area is known for flash flooding, there are plenty of other places around this country that are also susceptible to flash flooding. And we've seen an increase in number and frequency and intensity of extreme rainfall events that, you know, this time it was Texas, but who knows where the next time, because there will be a next time somewhere in this country. You know, and one of the things that, you know, again, that are that are coming out and as folks are connecting the dots, and that's what I like to do here, is the fact that Doge cut about a thousand jobs out of NOAA and the National Weather Service. These are critical jobs of folks like yourselves who were on top of uh, being able to look at satellite imaging, being able to look at storms, to coordinate with local emergency uh, personnel in order to minimize, right, the amount of deaths, minimize the amount of damage, because look, What we know is that these type of extreme weather events are extreme due to climate change and that every year, every season, that places that were uh, always going to be in the in the target zone of these of these changes are in these red states, are in areas like uh, Flash Flood Alley and what have you. But the rate at which these events are happening, that they're saying, oh, well, it's once in a thousand years. These things are happening once in a few seasons, once every couple of months. So talk to us about the connection to where we are right now with this tragedy and how climate change has exacerbated it and how now these cuts have exacerbated what this has happened here, but what's coming as we begin hurricane season? Yeah. And as you mentioned, I am one of those people who was cut. I had worked at NOAA starting in 2010, and then I had become a federal employee in 2023, and I was fired 14 days before my probation period ended. And my story is not unique. There are a lot of other people who were let go, or a lot of other people who took early retirement or took uh, the fork in the road email, whatever you want to call it, that are no longer working at NOAA. And it's not just the fact that that human being is gone, but it's also all of that experience is gone. People who've worked at NOAA 30 years are gone. People who have forecasted the weather for certain communities for that long, who know the intricate details of what normally happens, the people that you need to be in contact with, the communities that tend to flood, all of this really vital information contained within a person who is no longer at NOAA. 
And obviously, climate change is a thing. It is a real thing. It's happening right now. It is only going to get worse as we continue to emit greenhouse gases. And one of the clear-cut sorts of impacts of climate change, besides making temperatures warmer and increasing heat, uh, is also the fact that we are seeing increasing extreme rainfall events. Mm -hmm. You've seen this since the middle of the 20th century to now across much of the country, including Texas and the Southeast, the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic, the Midwest, the Great Lakes, the Northwest. And we're expecting to see that continue to get even worse than it is now. And what this is showing is that we are not prepared for the extreme weather of today, let alone what we are going to see in the future due to climate change. And we know that climate change is not picky. It will do what it does somewhere. Same with weather. It'll happen somewhere. It's just a matter of time. And we talk about these events as you know, right, one in 100 years. It basically means there's a 1% right. chance of it happening in the beginning of the year. But that's assuming a static climate. Our climate's anything mm -hmm. but static. Our climate is warming. These extremes are changing. So an event that may have been a, quote, one in a hundred year event 20 years ago does not mean it's going to be a one in a hundred year event today. And it certainly doesn't mean it's going to be that in the future. They're going to happen more and more often. And other aspects of what NOAA does, we know NOAA does the forecast. The National Weather Service issues the forecast, but NOAA also does the science behind how these extremes are changing. NOAA does the research in how we communicate better the risks of these events so people can make the best actions. NOAA also uh, does some of the work with these communities to help implement adaptation measures that mm -hmm. we know these rivers flood. It's called Flash Flood Alley for a reason. So how can we work with communities to minimize the risk of flooding? All of which is something that could be cut. Uh, could easily go away. And this is something that we're not prepared for the right now, let alone the future, where we know things are going to get worse. You know what was crazy? So in Project 2025, which I'm sure you are familiar with, on page, I think it was 675, was their entire plan for NOAA and the National Weather Service was that they believed the folks, Heritage Foundation, Trump folks, believed that the National Weather System and NOAA had become politicized and putting out climate change information that was going to affect industry and that it needed to be shrunk, right? And it needed to be broken apart. And that was fully written out in a 900 page memo in the PDF that was free for people to see as we were leading up into the 2024 presidential election. And here we are. And following that, when Trump's budget came out, which is now law, that gut NOAA, that gut uh, uh, the National Weather Service, a group of former leaders of the National Weather Service put out an open letter to the American people that said that these cuts are going to cost lives. And now following this tragedy, where I say as of right now, 95 people are dead, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson said, all we can do is offer prayers. What do you say to that? You know, one thing that I always loved about NOAA and really I loved about the weather community, which is what I come from on a part of, is at no point does anyone ever think like, who did this person vote for before giving them potentially life-saving information? We have so many examples of how important it is to help people with the right forecasts, but also it's helping people afterwards with actions, physical actions with people on the ground, with money to support, because we know that uh, these events, just because they happen right now, and they'll be suffering the consequences of this for decades and decades and decades to come. And that requires consistent help and work. And I feel like that is the key thing with all of these, quote, natural disasters, right. as natural mm -hmm. as they are, yep. that the actions, like we can't just, uh, we can't just say words. We have to do actions. We have to help people out, especially because given where this, this location is, mm -hmm. there could be flash floods later on this year. There could mm -hmm. be flash floods next year. We already know this, this area needs help, right? And we already know uh, just how important it is to have a robust and strong and fully staffed National Weather Service and FEMA to be able to help communities out. And 
when it comes to issuing the forecast, that includes working with local county, state officials to make sure everyone knows what to do, who to call, what the issues are. You know, and right now, right, I mean, following, you know, the, this tragedy as as things continue to unfold, Texas officials were blaming the National Weather Service. They got on television in their press conferences and said that it was the National Weather Service's fault. We should have had warnings earlier. And look, I'm the political person here and will say that the county that was hit voted for Trump by 77 percent. Right. So I know that the people that were standing up there, it's all likelihood that they voted for Donald Trump, that they voted for this. This area, this county also, which I think has 50,000 people in this rural area, were warned that these events are going to continue to happen should they invest in, right, developing, like you said, these early detection systems, these mitigating uh, mechanisms that they can put in place in order to minimize the damage. And the people in that area voted against it because it was going to cost money to do that. How do we reconcile, do you think, the reality of rural areas, the lack of resources that they have, but also an ideology that has become pervasive that tells them that the damage that is being done right now is just an act of God as opposed to right science and climate change and things that there can, there are things to do in this moment um, and that it does in, does require resources and investment in order to save lives? Yeah. So it's a really good question. To how do we reach people? And I always say I've been communicating weather and climate science for a very, very long time. And even with all of my knowledge and my ability to read scientific journals and all this scientific gobbledygook, I know that when it comes to getting a message across to somebody, I'm from New York originally. I feel like it comes across when I talk really fast. If you <laughs> plot me somewhere else in the middle of the country, another place, like it's very obvious I'm not from there. I'm not as good of a messenger about this topic than someone who's from that community. And part of and parcel of like, how do we have people understand the risks and understand truly what's at stake is not necessarily me going into a community and being able to talk to them because I, I don't know Texas. I may have been, I've been to Texas once or twice in my life, but there are people who live in those communities who are within those communities who can talk about these risks. And it's one of the benefits of the National Weather Service that these forecasts aren't coming from Washington, D.C. They're coming from an office that lives in the community. This, this is not like the federal government way away. These are people who you meet at church, you'll see at the, the grocery store. And it's our ability to how do we create more lines of communication so people realize that these risks, these risks are being told to you by a friend or a colleague that you can trust, that you know that who's just looking out for you. Um, and when it comes to climate and these extremes, it is very, very hard to imagine something you've never experienced before. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a bit of a failure of just the human imagination for some of these extremes. No one has ever probably witnessed something like what just happened in Texas. And we see it's what happened in Asheville, North Carolina, mm -hmm. what happened in Charleston, what happened in upstate New York and Vermont from previously, what happened in Connecticut over last summer. These unbelievable rainfall amounts that led to widespread flooding, it led to flash flooding, it led, led sadly to, to people losing their lives. And it is incredibly hard for us to imagine those scenarios. Um, it's just human nature. So how do we communicate? I don't know if I have a good answer, but how do we communicate that what we're seeing are things that we haven't seen before? How do we prepare for something that we haven't seen before? And it's a huge question, but I really do believe it begins with community and the way we can deal with these risks and the way we can get through some of these extremes is, again, relying on community and starting with the community. And that involves just having increased conversations and creating the spaces for people to be able to communicate with each other. Yeah, it's just, you know, I, I I find this moment to be extraordinary because I don't, what I fear right now, Tom, is that we're not going to learn anything from this. We'll learn, right, that 
Doge cuts led to a lack of skilled personnel. We'll learn that the Department of Defense shut down NOAA's access to satellites that would allow them to see storms that are intensifying in real time. We'll learn all of those things. But under this current regime, nothing is going to change. As a matter of fact, because of the passage of the billionaire bill, that this is actually just going to get worse. So what would your warning be to people who are just like, oh, well, you know, we, we, we can't politicize this moment. All we can do is pray when we know that we are just at the beginning of what has become one of the most devastating climate seasons, which is hurricane season. Yes, I'm not politicizing anything. I'm just talking about science. You know, and I'm just talking about the facts in front of me and the reason why I do this, the reason why people in the National Weather Service do this, the reason why scientists, climate scientists, meteorologists do this is because of a pure, unadulterated mission to help people. I don't like seeing people getting hurt. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you voted for. I don't care what sports team you rooted for. I don't care. I just want to make sure that you're safe. And that feeling is not just me. That feeling is part and parcel for a heck of a lot of federal employees, first of all, as the core driving mission. And, you know, when it comes to the fact, yeah, things are likely to get worse. We're warming our planet still. We know that's still going to make things worse. But the choice is still ours. And I know that the people making these forecasts are still going to be making them as best as they can. They're still going to be working with communities as the best that they can. But we're clearly not supporting them as we have in the past, and that is going to have repercussions. But it's important for us to speak up to the benefits to these things. I feel Mm -hmm. like a lot of folks don't understand necessarily just what value they get from the federal government. And it's one of those things where the polls come out and they say, I don't want want to get rid of federal employees. We need less federal employees. But then if you ask them specifically, well, do you want to get rid of people who study cancer research? Do you want to get rid of people who forecast the weather? They're like, no, I didn't mean that. And I think... Part of that is we, you know, when the weather service and when Noah's working well, you don't know about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it works well a lot. So you don't necessarily know about these impacts. And the key here is to communicate just what is at stake by reducing these data, this data, reducing the resources. Uh, because in the end, it's something that all of us, no matter where you live, are vulnerable to. There, are, there is extreme weather in different types that affects every single part of the world. So any hits to the National Weather Service, to NOAA, to FEMA is going to be felt across these communities. It's just a matter of time before an extreme comes. I want to thank you so much for making the time today to join us on As the World Turns and for the work that you continue um, to do at Climate Central, um, because I think it's incredibly important for people to understand the real life impacts, the real world impacts of where we are right now. And the fear is that this is just the beginning. Thank you so much, Tom. Appreciate you um, and continue your really, really good work. Yeah, thank you for having me.